Hi everyone, I'm Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today. I've been a space and astronomy journalist for over 20 years now. And I like to be able to bring you guys all behind the scenes and watch as I actually interview some of the researchers, the scientists who are working on the ideas and the concepts that you're so familiar with. And today I've got a very special guest, Dr. Robert, Robin Hansen. Uh, Dr. Hansen, welcome to my YouTube channel. I'm happy to join the universe here. Yeah, right on. Um, so the question I always ask people is, is like, who are you? What do you do? I'm an associate professor of economics at George Mason University. I am somewhat of a polymath in the sense that I've worked on a lot of different areas over my lifetime. And so at this stage in my career, I'm 62 years old, I less think of myself as an economist or any other particular thing and just more as a scholar or intellectual who's just trying to study what's interesting. Mm -hmm. So that's why I recently went back to astrophysics. <laughs> right. And I mean, as you say, you're an economist, so your work rarely impacts the, the field that I work in, but you have put some very, very influential ideas into this sphere. And I would absolutely love to to get into them. Um, uh, the first one is, I mean, yeah, all right, I was, it, it feels like your more recent paper with the with the idea of the grabby aliens, almost helps provide more of a better introduction into the great filter. So I, it's I, it's making numerical estimates on what was just in principle an abstract process without numerical estimates. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, it's absolutely fascinating. Both papers are, are wonderful. So let's, I, I kind of feel like I want to talk about them in, in reverse. So, so let's talk about this idea of, of like, how did you start to think about the Fermi paradox and this idea of like the universe is old and the universe is gigantic and, and life on earth formed almost instantaneously and yet we see no evidence of aliens out there in the universe. What sort of got you thinking on this? Well, I'm not sure I can dig back to know exactly where I started because <laughs> it was you know, over 25 years ago. But what is the fascination? What is the, what was, I, I'm trying to think of like, what got so, you hooked you know, on the, the idea? The key question, of course, is we see ourselves now of, on a planet full of life in a civilization full of activity and growth and when we just look locally at our future, it looks bright. That is, we look like we can expand and grow and become a really big thing. And then we look out into the universe and we don't see anything out there like what we hope to become. And that's the conflict right from the beginning. Right. Well, how could it be that we had this plausible chance to going out and becoming this big visible thing that remakes galaxies if nothing out there seems to have done that? Uh, that's the first puzzle to come to terms with. So um, now it suggests that this thing that we want to become has to be a very rare process. That is, it can't be very often that such a thing happens. Just how rare is the question, but it has to be pretty rare. And um, that's how most people have discussed this question before. And my contribution early on was just to reframe that in terms of what I call the great filter. That is, to think of a set of processes that started from simple dead matter and then progressed through stages and then eventually would reach the stage where it was big and visible in the universe. And then the obvious conclusion is that transition process must be very rare. Uh, almost all the things that start out as a simple dead planet don't end up as one of these big expanding civilizations. So, but it's not just that that number is really low. If we can think of a filter as a set of processes, then the number is the product of a bunch of numbers. <laughs> and so the product is low. Right. We can think of the number as the conditional probability that if you reach one stage, you'll get on to the next one by a certain time saying. Got to turn and the light. Okay, sorry, please continue. That there we go. conditional, that, that big number being really low means that at least one of those numbers along the way must be really low. <laughs> now, it could be that many of them were really small, uh, and that becomes the question of the great filter. Um, where along this process is most of the filter? That is, in terms of where are the big, not small, where are the really small numbers? Where are the big obstacles to going from one place to the next? And I also 
reframed this issue as we can think of this filter in terms of all the steps up to where we are now, and then all the steps that would go from here to this visible endpoint of being, you know, big and visible in the universe. And we can ask, how much do we know about which fraction of the filter is behind us and which fraction is ahead of us? And obviously, uh, this update could be telling us bad news or, or lowering our expectations by telling us that the chance of going on from here to become this big visible things is very low if much of the filter is ahead of us. So one sort of way to do it might be to say, there's roughly 10 to the 24 you know, planets in the observable universe. And if only one out of all of those arguably reaches a stage like ours, then this total filter is 10 to the 24. And now out of 24 orders of magnitude there, if only two of them were left in front of us, that is we had gone through 22 orders of magnitude, <laughs> almost done, but only two orders of magnitude lay in front of us, that still means we only have a 1% chance. Mm -hmm. So even just a little bit of filter ahead of us is pretty negative news about our chance of reaching this big visible state. So uh, then we might ask what evidence would tell us about how much of the filter is behind us and how much ahead of us. And the obvious thing is any other independent or uh, evidence of life up to our stage, but not beyond our stage would be evidence that the filter behind us was easier than we thought, which then has to lead to the filter ahead of us being harder than we thought, which is bad news. So then the story is we found life on Mars say that was independent of life on earth. That would be really bad news for our future. Right. So like when, when I, or I guess when people first encounter this idea of, of the Fermi paradox, I, I find they dismiss it quite quickly they say, well, the, you know, there's this analogy of like, you're looking at an ocean and you've dipped a little spoon into the ocean and you look and you don't see any whales. And therefore you can, you conclusively decide that the ocean has no whales. How, you know, and, the, and there are a range of these, right? And then people say, well, maybe it's really difficult to get from planet to planet or places are or stars, star to star places are really far. Right. You know, there are these sort of ad hoc instinctual responses to the Fermi paradox that people bring up. They're not all ad hoc. I mean, many of them are quite reasonable and deserve sure. to be addressed now. Yep. <laughs> we, yep. we should yep. just try to go through them. Yeah. Uh, so, so, so I guess like when I first heard this concept of the, of the great filter, I think I was sort of at a place where I found it very chilling, a very kind of terrifying nightmarish idea. And, and I think that's because I had already moved past the dismissing the Fermi paradox. And I'm firmly in the, the Fermi paradox is a deeply unsettling idea. Why is it a, why should we not dismiss the Fermi paradox so easily? So the key would be to distinguish between a civilization that looks like us now and a civilization that's at this end point of the problematic observation of the Fermi paradox. There is quite a difference between those two. So we right now are clearly very small and would be very hard to detect from a long distance. So it's completely reasonable to say there could be a lot of things out there just like us that we couldn't see. That's not at all crazy. The question is just how plausible is it that there could be, you know, billions of things like us and yet nothing at that next level. That's more the, the tension. So the Fermi paradox is where you look out and you say, I don't see any big civilizations in the sky. So part of this, the, this issue here is to actually try to imagine what might happen to our civilization in say the next million years. Mm -hmm. And I think that's part of the mental block is that people often have this block about futurism where they go, we couldn't possibly know anything out of the future. We shouldn't say anything. It just must stay this abstract uncertainty. <laughs> And therefore, it's just sort of blocked off. I mean, you have to get past that here because we have to ask, what could something like us look like in a million years? Now, obviously, one of the things it could look like is we'd just be dead and gone, yeah. <laughs> in which case that's completely consistent with what we see. But the question is, if we didn't go dead and gone, if we continued to grow and then started to expand and moved out in the universe and used it, <laughs> changed things, 
then it would seem like we're more visible. But, but that seems awful sort of emotionally awkward in the sense that many people are uncomfortable with this mm -hmm. idea that not only were we drastically changing the Earth at the moment, <laughs> but we might drastically change the solar system and the galaxy and, and far more. Not just pass by, pass a few markers, leave some fences <laughs> and goodwill you know, statues, but actually like take apart stars, rearrange matter, build entirely enormous factories and machines, and just remake it. Right. And that's the sort of thing that you would see out there. That is the, the key thing is you look out there, you, it, everything looks, looks completely natural. So we don't know exactly what an advanced civilization will do with things, but the key idea is they, they do something. <laughs> the state of nature wouldn't be the optimal state for them for whatever purposes they had. And the main reasons we ever say on earth, leave things alone is because usually that's too much trouble so far to bother to change them. You know, Everest is still standing because at the moment it's too much trouble to rearrange Everest, take it down, put those rocks somewhere more useful. Right. So there they sit. But, you know, we have on the, things that were more valuable to us and things that were easier to do we have you know built canals and roads and knocked down forests and we have built things and we've changed them because just in in general when we have resources and we have a thing that's important to us the best use of that is usually not the way it started and it's not just us. I mean, life itself. I mean, you observe the earth from space and there are portions that look green. And that is forests reshaping the planet to their right. needs and creating entire right. biospheres and biomes that that match. It's, it's worth planet. noting, though, how little life is done <laughs> in the sense that, you know, there's this huge ball of rock. And the stuff that's been done has been done to this tiny layer of a, of a meters, meters on the top of that surface. <laughs> And pretty much all the rock below is pretty much all the rock as it was. And so when we look on the surface of the earth, we see enormous effects that life has because we're focused on this top meter or few of the surface. But honestly, life so far has been limited in, in how far it could go and what it could do. And I think you have to sort of imagine that our future descendants will move past those limits. That is, life is very impressive in what it can do within the spaces that it can get to, but it's really very limited compared to what we should expect our descendants to be able to do. So what would a future of humanity look like? Let's assume there is no great filter in front of us. We continue our economic growth at a rate that is maybe even slower than what we've been in over the last century, but still non-zero. How does that exponential growth turn into a large civilization over the course of, of hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands, billions of years. So at the moment, our economy doubles roughly every 15 years before the Industrial Revolution had doubled roughly every thousand years. So let's assume a worst case that we go back to the slow growth of the farming era, where it doubled only every thousand years. Now, clearly, if you want to have a thousand doublings, uh, you know, two to the thousand is just more than the observable universe worth of stuff. So clearly we couldn't just grow exponentially through a thousand doublings until we hit some limits, but a thousand doublings at a thousand years per doubling is a million years. So even at that much slower growth within a million years, clearly we hit some sort of limit. So the obvious limits are that we could fill up the solar system exponentially. Uh, so fill up, they would take apart the earth and the planets and, and the asteroids, and then even start to take apart the sun and rearrange it. But, then we would reach, you know, having taken apart the sun and everything nearby, and that would be a big strong limit of what do you do next? In order to have more stuff then, you have to go elsewhere. And so now you would face this speed of light limit and that the amount of stuff you could get to would only grow as the cube of time, even though you might have a technology that could grow exponentially. And so then what you expect is pressures to sort of grow at as fast a speed as is feasible to go out as fast as possible to grab new star systems and do to, do to them what we have filled up here on our system before that. And, and I mean, I think it's really important to put a flag here and just note that none of this is necessarily a good thing. Like, oh, right. So like, we're, we're just predicting what would happen, not whether we approve. Right, right. And, and I and and so you can imagine a 1000 civilizations out there, 999 of which say, we're going to live 
at peace in a, at a sustainable level within the constraints of our biosphere and not extend our presence and not dismantle all of our planets and stars and so on and so forth. But but if you have one that does, that's a problem for the other 999. So um, I was just like reading an essay about a famous uh, Greek Thucydides, who was a realist historian, and he was started this tradition of saying, let's just look at what actually happens in terms of warfare and civilizations and not at what we wish would happen. And, you know, it took a while for that to become a tradition in history and in, even in foreign relations to just talk about what was likely to happen, not what you wish would happen. But I think when people look towards humanity's future, they, they are reluctant to do that. Uh, they, they feel more of an obligation to be hopeful and maybe there are signs to be hopeful uh, and to sort of wish that not only into our descendants, but basically any sort of reasonable advanced descendant, that, that the idea that just advanced civilization would just be better according to our lives. Um, and again, as you say, maybe well, only one out of a thousand will deviate from that, <laughs> but still that one out of a thousand would make this enormous impact. So right. when we look out into for alien civilizations, I think we can plausibly categorize them into these two classes, loud and quiet. <laughs> loud are the ones that are going to follow the strategy of expanding as fast as possible and making a big visible difference, but whether we approve of that or not. And the quiet ones would stay small and, and have a smaller impact. And from our point of view right now, we couldn't really see very many quiet ones, but we could see loud ones. And you might not think that says much, but that's sort of the analysis we're doing in our grabby aliens work is to say, we could see loud ones. We don't see loud ones. What does that tell us? And it actually tells us a lot. So with the with this more recent paper, the grabby aliens paper, you were able to put numbers to a lot of the theories that have been been flying around. So can you can you talk about this? So, again, this is a theory at first of just about the loud ones. We're not going to be saying anything about the quiet ones. We're just going to talk about the loud ones to start with. OK. And so the simple theory is loud aliens appear at some point in space time. <laughs> That is uh, recently say we've appeared in the last say 10,000 years here on earth. So a loud alien civilization appears at some point in space time. And then soon after it starts to expand as fast as it can. And um, there's three parameters to this model. There's the rate at which it, expe it expands. And then there's two parameters of how it appears. And uh, one parameter of how it appears is a constant. Whatever function we're going to have is going to have a constant out in front. But the other parameter is a power of a power law. And that's the thing that takes a little explaining. So if you look at the history of life on Earth, uh, there's a standard model to explain this history says uh, we had to go through a number of these great filter steps before the window for life on Earth would close. So there was a 5 billion rough, roughly window. And there are a bunch of processes, each of which might be a very rare process to achieve. But if we condition on finishing it by the window, then we'll find that they all had to happen within that window. And they will be roughly equally spaced out, even if they all have very different difficulties. So we first have the first kind of life, and then maybe a more advanced kind of life, and then a sexual selection, and then maybe photosynthesis, mm -hmm. and multicellularity, some different steps. And the idea is evolution was just searching in the space of possibilities. And then it came across the next step, i.e. say photosynthesis. And then from then on, it, that, that spread. And now life has photosynthesis, but now it's searching in the space for the next thing, i.e. sexual selection. Um, and so the key idea is um, if you had a bunch of steps that all had to happen within this window, it could be that you know each step is really unlikely to happen within the window but conditional on them all finishing by the end of the window then we're going to see them roughly equally spaced and then if we see a couple of the steps we can guess from their fraction of the total how many total steps are there and then we can know that the actual chance of life appearing by that deadline of the before the life ends goes as the power law of that number of steps and that's a robust mathematical feature of this model and so then we say the appearance of advanced life in the universe goes as this power law. It wasn't equally spread across time. Uh, it was growing across time with this power. And this power is, say, roughly six, say, three to 12 in that range. Uh, and so 
that's one of the parameters of this of this model is this power. Um, and so that means that you know billions of years ago there was almost no chance of advanced life appearing, and then lately it's been speeding up a lot, getting much faster, and things are happening farther away, uh, around the same time as now because we're appearing here now. And this power law says there's a correlation in time when they appear. And in order to finish this model, all we need is these other two parameters. Right. So we got this power and now we need the constant and we need the speed. Okay. The speed is actually relatively easy in the sense that if the speed was say a third the speed of light or smaller, then the model strongly predicts that at a random time when one eight gravity aliens appears, it would see many others in the sky and they would be huge, much bigger than the full moon. You couldn't miss them. Not like you need telescopes to find them. And we don't see those. So the obvious implication is they're expanding fast, a substantial fraction of the speed of light. And that's why we don't see them now. That is, and so if they're expanding really fast, by the time you see them, they're almost here. Hmm. And so the model then says, um, that's our prediction that they're fanning really fast. And the, the, to get the last parameter, what we're going to assume is out and fill the universe or not. And so our date at the moment is a random sample from the date of the origins of when gravity alien civilizations appear. So then that's the key a third assumption that lets us pin the model down. We say our date is a random sample from origin dates of um, civilizations in the model. So now we've got the three parameters. We've got the power law that says the rate at which they speed up appearing. We've got the constant from this uniform distribution over our rank in the distribution. And we've got the speed from the fact we don't see anything in the sky. And this is a simple statistical model that we can run and get distributions from. And then those answer all the interesting questions you wanted to know about aliens in the universe. It, and so the claim is we, we know this. And furthermore, I got to tell you, like, you might say, why should I believe this model? Because you could be like, Maybe we're the only thing out there, completely empty, and you know, then there wouldn't be anything else out there for as far as we could see, and we'd just be the only ones who would ever appear. And our story is you really can't believe that model very confidently because we actually appear really early compared to that model. So we're on a planet that lasts five billion years. Okay. The average star will last five trillion years okay and this you know power law origin of life applies to that time duration so uh if this power is six then you've got uh these other long-lived stars are more likely to have advanced life appear on them compared to our sun by a factor of a thousand raised to the power of six right okay that is we are really crazy early according to that. So now to solve that, there's there's two approaches. One is if you have to find a way to say that long-lived stars just can't possibly be the origin of life. There's just something about them that completely excludes that possibility. Or you say, well, this analysis assumed the universe would just stay empty and wait for whenever they appeared. But if there are rabbi alien civilizations popping up and filling the universe, then there's a deadline. When they fill everything, it's too late to appear. And that's our story about why we are early. We are early because the other gravity civilizations are also early and they will soon fill up the universe after which you can't appear. The only civilizations that can appear are the ones that appear this early. And that's why you need to believe in this model. That is, that's what's telling you they're out there right now. And assuming like we have a random rank in terms of the origin dates, then on average, about half the universe is full of them right now. Hmm. Right now out there, half the universe is full of these big advanced civilizations that we can't see because they're expanding at almost the speed of light toward us. And we won't see them until all, they're almost here. And so like the experience of being in a universe that is very filled with these civilizations would be kind of similar to appearing or being born and being raised here on planet Earth. And you look around, and you see lots of other humans, you see lots of other life forms, you see plants, you're always within a few meters away from a spider. Um, that this right. planet has been well uh, explored and adapted and 
to every single nook and cranny of the of the whole place. At least the first, the top meter yes. or two yes, of the yes, surface. Yes, yes, yes. I know, I know. You've got, you've got. Okay. Yeah. Just look, look your, vertically. You can your see the subterranean of all shadow height. biosphere. Yeah, we'll we'll deal with your subterranean shadow biosphere in a in a future episode, maybe. Um, but but yeah, the surface of the planet, the I guess the explorable environment on Earth to the kind of life that we are not the radioactive lava creatures that live down below. W when you appeared on Earth, and when you started to first have those memories, you can see yourself surrounded by life forms. And that's what it would feel right. like to be in a civilization that is surrounded by other civilizations right. around the universe. For most of them, they will not have the Fermi paradox of looking up at the right. universe, right? So yeah. it's only those of us who appear very early at the beginning of one of these civilizations that looks out and sees an empty universe. So our statistical analysis of uh, these parameters suggests a, a substantial range, but roughly in the middle of the distribution is we will meet them in roughly a billion years. <laughs> if we go out as fast as we can, they go out. That's roughly when we'll meet them, but it could be a hundred million or 3 billion or something. And uh, they appear roughly once per thousand per million galaxies actually. Wow. So that, that's roughly how rarely they appear once per million galaxies. And then they span out at roughly the speed of light and they meet another one in roughly a billion years. And then everything's full. So we are now at 14 billion years in the history of the universe. So the story is at 15 billion years, game over. <laughs> universe is full. Hmm. Uh, but we are in the middle of the distribution of this filling up process. And we are about to perhaps become these grabby descendants or not. Now, we extended the model a little bit and in, to postulating a ratio, let's say, let's say there's some amount of quiet civilizations like us, and then a certain fraction of them become grabby. And we can vary that fraction parameter. And one of the things that fraction influences is our future optimism. <laughs> the, uh, you know, the smaller the chance is, then, the, you know, less our but as that ratio goes up, the closer becomes the nearest quiet. So if you were hoping through, say, SETI to go out there and look and see some evidence of a quiet civilization, you know, not completely quiet, obviously, they have to make some noise so you need to see them, but they're not going to be the huge grabby that fills a huge volume of the sky and changes everything. Um, the higher this ratio is, then the closer will be the nearest one. So I said they appear once roughly one per million galaxies, right? Well, that means if there's a million to one ratio, then there's roughly one per galaxy of the quiet ones. If there's one per million galaxies of the loud ones, right? And so now in order to be optimistic about SETI, about seeing alien civilizations in the sky uh, who are quiet because we don't see the loud ones and those would be really obvious, then you need to believe this ratio is really large. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> There's a trade-off here, right? So the more quiet, the closer the nearest quiet one is, the more chance you could see it. But then the smaller the chance is we will become loud. Right. So, you know, if I sort of understand the model correctly, as you say, one in one million galaxies has a civilization that is expanding rapidly at some rough percentage of the speed of light. And if there are 2 trillion, sorry, yeah, 2 trillion galaxies in the universe there, that still gives you a few a thousand, <laughs> a few thousand uh, rapidly expanding civilizations. And of course, you know, we can only we can only actually if we right now set off at, at light speed, or almost light speed, we could only reach about I think it's like 6% of the observable universe, the rest right. of it's going to fall over the the cosmological horizon. Yep. So I can imagine these sort of overlapping spheres of of influence uh, in in the future. But that's really far away. I mean, how big of a sphere if it's one in a million, I'm trying to think of like how many like we are a few hundred million light years away from the nearest civilization. So you know, a sphere, uh, a cube uh, with a million things in it is roughly 100 on a side. Yeah. So that's roughly the spacing you should expect between here and the next civilization, roughly 100 galaxies away. Yeah. Now, it turns out our galaxy is roughly 100 times larger than the average galaxy. So, um, right. 
a little a little correction there. Uh, but still, that's roughly how far away you should expect. And it's plausibly on the scale of, say, you know, 50 million light years or something. Right, so, right. But which is a pretty short time. Yeah, I mean, the, the last time, you know, that that was the dinosaurs was 50 million, you know, the... the right. The... So, so an interesting, like, story about this is that we can say much more specific things about the future than we you might have thought were possible. So the story is, we will make a choice soon about whether to become grabby. And if we do... We will expand out at near the speed of light. And then in roughly a billion years, we will meet other alien civilizations. We'll meet different ones in different directions. <laughs> and then at the border, we will have a cultural exchange. <laughs> there might be conflict there, but um, that will happen in roughly 1 billion years. And we know that like for the next 100 billion years, there's plenty of time for travel and exchange. And so by the time, say, 150 billion light years, years from now, when... The, the galaxies start to separate and can't communicate with each other during that period there will be a period of a lot of interaction and exchange among all these different alien civilizations and you know that's a thing to aspire to we might want to hope to become respected in that community and uh, they find things about us worthy of emulation and of course we'll want to find things worthy of them of emulation and that's this long period of sort of the god's communion mm -hmm. <laughs> these you know Gravity civilizations are the gods of the universe, then they interact uh, at the time period, and we might just hope to join them and earn some respect. But we can't even join them unless we get past this um, obstacles in the near term. But you can imagine this sort of far, far future, billions, tens of billions of years into the future, when the forces of the expansion of the universe, the forces of dark energy, separate the galaxy clusters to the point that you're left with I mean, in the case of say the milky right. way really we're just we're only going to have the local group it's going to be the milky way it's going to be right and i understand it's roughly 100 and billion 150 billion years right till that happens so we've got this period between a billion years from now and 150 billion years from now when we can have all this interaction uh until that separation now there's some chance that we could somehow prevent that perhaps uh, there's some speculation but you know, that's way far in the future, but right. you know, yep. it might be that we sort of burn up all the resources between now and that period anyway. And by the time that happens, there's hardly anything left to use. Uh, that's another possibility, but that's somewhat separate. But you can imagine a civilization at that point, like, I guess, a post interaction period where now everyone is left stuck in their island universe all the the limited resources that they have left at their disposal and a complete disconnection from the rest of the of the universe and you can imagine a civilization you know what would their perspective be at that point as they look at the universe that they find themselves in would they then sort of make assumptions about what the I mean, universe you have to realize like? that we most of us in our world on earth today have pretty parochial perspectives <laughs> we're looking at our our family and our job and our neighborhood and maybe our city or perhaps our continent we, we typically like don't think on the entire earth scale and so if this future civilization is only looking at the scale of a group of galaxies using cultural inputs from the few thousand nearest alien civilizations it ever met, it's still going to have a vastly larger scope of view than most of us do today. So I find it hard to criticize them too much for being too parochial compared to us. Yeah. But they would be forced at some point then to sort of make do with what they had learned by that time because they're not going to get more signals from the outside after that point. Yeah, it's, but 150 billion years, plenty of time, presumably, to get lots of data from the rest of the universe. Yeah, it, it is funny. I, I, you know, when I discuss some of these topics on on this show, people people get a sort of a sense of a bit of an ennui about the fact that the sun is going to cook the earth, that eventually the sun will run out of fuel and and die as a as a red giant, that that we will eventually face the heat death of the universe you know and my recommendation is get some exercise eat your vegetables um you know we have some very short-term right. issues that we really need to focus <laughs> on you know as opposed to like worrying about this these existential long-term thing but it is kind of inevitable 
So, you know, part of our growth in history has been learning about larger scales and taking larger views than we had before. And that's been an exciting process, but we shouldn't necessarily expect that to go on forever. <laughs> Eventually, we might expect to reach the largest feasible scale on which we could learn about things and have influence. And at that point, this game of learning about larger scales ends. We, we reach the limits. Yeah. Um, and so the same for the, say, the heat death of the universe story. I mean, in the past, we've slowly acquired more and more kinds of resources and found way, more ways to be efficient with them and be able to achieve larger scales of production. That's been a long-term trend, but the heat, you know, thermodynamics says that doesn't go on forever. <laughs> Eventually, you reach the full neg entropy capacity of the space time you're in and you make full use of it, perhaps, but then it's over. Yeah. So what could we do? I mean, you know, your the, the paper, the, the concept of the grabby aliens is, as you say, a statistical probability of the kind of universe that we find ourselves in. And it puts some some very fascinating constraints, I think, that very few people had been able to fairly I know, comprehensively with math, explain their beliefs. Um, what could we do to try to put some concrete parameters associated with this underlying mathematical model? Well, so again, we have this model of three parameters. Uh, and it's based on this observation that we seem to be early. So one set of things we can clearly do is learn more about Earth's history. Um, we should be able to like tighten up some of these numbers about when things happened where and identify which things were unique and which things happened at multiple times or figure out which things were the hard steps. And uh, there, a recent paper came out uh, about how there might have been more hard steps clustered in the very beginning of the Earth or the very most recent period because of uh, other sorts of back, you know, steps that could take you backward or steps that could sort of knock you off the path to some bad stable point. So um, we could learn about those things in more detail. We could and therefore figure out this power in the power law more accurately. And that will tell us a lot about how close the nearest ones are. Um, then uh, obviously another thing we can do is go out looking for these other quiet civilizations. Our analysis suggests uh, not much hope, but you know you can confirm that by looking and probably not finding anything. But you will better pin down the estimate of how, how the ratio is between quiet and loud by looking out there. And uh, we can of course look more carefully at the universe. So it's possible that when alien civilizations expand, they use things and change things, but in a way that we just haven't noticed yet. <laughs> Which case, the prediction is there are these big spheres in the sky. And if we figure out the right thing to look at, you'll notice them and they'll be really obvious. And we just haven't been looking for the right thing. Mm -hmm. And so that's a thing we could go do is try to check on this assumption that we would just, they would be, I think it would be obvious, but it's not, you know, for sure. So it could be there's a way they change things that uh, if we look for the right combination of spectrum or shapes or whatever, that's then we would see it and then it would be clear. And then we would learn that, okay, I guess they're out there and they're not expanding near the speed of light. We could estimate the speed of expansion from the density of them in the, in the sky. That would so, be quite feasible. So just to understand, like, like if it's for some reason, the expansion is just not possible for whatever the laws of physics will not permit you to run your, you know, run you the expansion of your civilization at relativistic speeds, then that would give us a lot more time to just see this civilization out there slowly gobbling up their stars slowly changing over time because well so you know, we actually know according expanding. to our math analysis how soon till we meet them is roughly determined by uh this power law and if it turns out they expand at a slower speed what that would really mean is they're just closer to us but we're still going to meet them at the same date right <laughs> so right. we're fitting it to sort of the, the times and so um you know seeing them out there would let us more, know more about them we could look at sort of the edge of their distribution and see, you know, how sharp is the edge and see what happens there and try to figure out what they're doing out there by being able to look at them. And that could tell us a right. lot more about, say, what advanced technology is and what it can do by looking in detail at what they're doing. Uh, and that would be very informative. But, uh, you know, we'd still roughly meet them in the same time. And, and those surveys have been done. Uh, astronomers have have looked in the infrared spectrum for Dyson spheres here in the Milky Way. They've looked for 
uh, right? three but, Kardashev civilizations who have gobbled But what they're usually looking the for is, is small spheres. So, so, but this model is not predicting the tiny things that look. We're looking for things much bigger than the full moon, just huge circles in the sky. Right. Yeah, no, I mean, they've they've gone looking for galaxies that are giving off an infrared signature because they have been right. utterly consumed. And and you can imagine that a galaxy is probably not the optimal shape of a um, of a of a galaxy that right. is in use in, by a civilization that they will have rearranged it with their. But there's almost no chance to... you would see them at the point where they only have one galaxy. Right. Yeah, you would see you know, multiple would galaxies. Have... Thousands and millions of galaxies. Yeah, that, that that's the sign of thing you'd be seeing, and so that's the thing you'd be looking for. But you know that's a possible thing to do. The other thing, of course, we could do to elaborate this model is to understand our future better, uh, to think about what our future dependence is. So, and as you say, how feasible physical travel is. So I mean, we can actually like send things at near the speed of light near us. And make bigger things and see what happens to them as they fly near the speed of light that that's a thing we can do near here to see how feasible it is to fly it near the speed of light out there the argument that i've heard this is this, maybe space travel is too hard and then i you know i point out oumuamua like if a rock can do it we right. can do it and and if we're patient then then the actual motions of the stars bring them significantly closer to each other. And apparently, sure. if although that's at a very slow expansion speed. Yes. So the question is, 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 is a fast expansion speed possible? Yeah. Well, and so then they do would have to be moving faster. Although it still seems like if a rock can move slow, a rock can move fast. I mean, like, what's going to stop a slow rock from doing moving faster? The more plausible thing is, is the time duration required. That is, if you're moving a thing really fast near the speed of light, it's going to hit a lot of radiation, a lot of things smashing it. And, you know, can it basically have enough internal resources and repair capability to just keep going over the distances required? Uh, but even that doesn't look that hard. Um, another interesting stat that I'd heard, I talked to one of the principal investigators working on the on the Louvoir telescope. This is the follow on telescope to Hubble. And they were saying that it will be able to examine the atmospheres of, of nearby planets with such precision that that we can pretty much like 95% rule out the existence of any life in the Milky Way after it's completed its survey of our surroundings. Like if it just doesn't see any life, then yeah. you're 95% sure that there is no life in the Milky Way. So with this idea of of grabby aliens, what you're really saying is the reason we don't see any aliens out there is because we are effectively alone. We're alone in the Milky Way. It's a good 50 million to 100 million light years away toward to the nearest civilization. That is a problem for future us when we actually encounter them. And that explains the, the Fermi paradox. But so now let, let's talk about the great filter, because that is your other explanation for the for the Fermi paradox. Less hopeful more terrifying. Um, well, so it, it's the same thing, except the grabby aliens is giving numbers to the great filter. <laughs> so the great filter just says it's really rare. And who knows where it happens along the process. The grabby aliens is saying how rare it is exactly. So it's saying once per million galaxies <laughs> right. is how rare. And that's a, that's a concrete number rather than just saying abstractly, but it doesn't really say what are the obstacles along the path. So the great filter framing is more about, well, there must be obstacles. Where are they? And how far along that set of obstacles are we so far? So this analysis of the history of Earth and these hard steps does tell us a fair bit about how hard the path has been to get to this point. Yep. And we can learn more about that, but it already looks pretty hard. <laughs> um, but it still doesn't speak to sort of how hard it will be from here on. Uh, what is the obstacles from this point to to getting uh, becoming grabby? But I mean, you say that it's it's hard, and yet, literally, the the moment the Earth had cooled down, life seems to have formed within. That's a... predicted by this hard steps one. So sure, but within... the key thing is it it could have been really rare. That is, it could have been the expected time there was a trillion years. But if each of the say six steps that happen, each one had an expected time of a trillion years. 
then the only way all six of those steps are going to happen within five billion years if it's each one is really lucky and happening in a short time. And you can do the statistics to figure out roughly what, how long each step will have needed to take in order to fit them all in uh, the period. And so the prediction is, even if fundamentally it was really unlikely, it still had to happen pretty fast in order to fit all the steps in. Right. Yes. But so let's talk about the potential for there being steps ahead of us. Now you say if we find life on Mars that has evolved completely independently, I mean, it's great. Hurrah, Nobel prizes for everyone, but it's a bad thing. Why is it a bad thing if we find life on Mars? Um, what we know is it was unlikely, say for life to have go through all the steps by the deadline of 5 billion years, but unlikely could be one in 10 or 1% or it could be one in a trillion or one in 10 to the 20, right? There's different unlikelies. So if the whole great filter is huge and it was only a one in 10 chance of succeeding. So like if 10% of planets out there have end up with advanced life and clearly, you know, only one in a million galaxies has gravity aliens. And clearly there's a huge obstacle between merely reaching advanced life and becoming gravity, right? And so that's, so the fact that we see these hard steps happen across these times tells us that these steps had been hard enough that it was unlikely for any one planet to, to happen by the deadline, but it doesn't say how unlikely. And so that's the key thing we're wondering about. If we see life on Mars and we go, Oh my goodness, if it was independent now, of course, more likely it would be, you know, an offshoot, say, say life moved to Mars 2 billion years ago or moved from Mars here 2 billion years ago. Well then whatever happened in the last 2 billion years can't have been really hard if, if there was similar progress on both places, but whatever happened before the common origin, that could have been hard. Yeah. Um, and so if we do find a fairly advanced, say multicellular organism that is completely independent from life on earth, maybe one that is beginning the rudimentaries of tool use. Uh, this just gets worse and worse, which gets very bad news for our future. So yeah. something really hard must be in front of us. Right. So let's talk about that. Um, you know, I, I think it's about favorite this. topic. I mean, yeah, yeah, so yeah no, a, I know. I know. Sort of a doomsday, right? Yeah, I know. What could go wrong? <laughs> right. What could go wrong? I mean, but it's but but I guess the I guess the question is when I think about it, I think about what are the things that that you would think could explain it, but actually don't like, say, a, you know, a nuclear war. I mean, even with the nuclear war on Earth, civilizations right. would survive to some extent and rebuild. Right. Uh, if it if it was the AI that took us out, they would build their self if they could, the, right. yeah, it could absolutely chase us to space, they would be glad to build self replicating right. robot probes and and build, you know, turn the universe into paper clips. So, so what kinds of events, like, not necessarily what it could be, but what are kind of the parameters of future events that could could be the great filter? So one class of things is a disaster so bad that you just get knocked back, not just to the stone age, but say pre multicellular or something. <laughs> so, right. uh, you know, actually yeah. multicellular life is actually more fragile than single cellular life. So it's quite possible that same supernovas have happened near earth and basically wiped out, boiled all the oceans, <laughs> wiped out everything on land. And all that was left was microbes a kilometer or 10 kilometers down underground. Right. But that would be enough to bring things back. Right. And so if life had another billion years after that, it could come back to our level again. So it's really hard to like really kill all life on Earth enough to prevent multicellular life from returning in a relatively short time. Um, that's the difficulty with those scenarios. You have to like kill it all the way to the core. Right. <laughs> right. Now, even uh, even your underground rock people. But like a different scenario is where you sort of produce a stable equilibrium where there's a kind of life that won't let other life appear in its place. So if, if, if you're the last few multi, you know, single cell things a kilometer underground and, you, and, the, and the surface cools and now you can slowly go up and grow, nobody's in your way and you can do that. But if there's a kind of life that's in your way, then it may not be possible to come back. So. The thing that you should human history we have you know 
thought we've seen at least stable societies like say ancient Egypt, which were not very interested in innovation or growth, but could prevent other such societies nearby from doing such things because they would be a threat. And so if you had a kind of life on earth that was advanced enough to displace the kind of life that would be required to grow and become civilization, then that would be more of a threat, some sort of a, a replacement that sort of enforces conformity, enforces a lack of innovation, enforces a particular style. And it's you know not crazy that that could have happened to life on Earth. So you know, for example, it looks like the first I don't know three billion years of life on Earth, life doesn't look like it changed that much. <laughs> looks yeah. like it was really pretty stable, and then somehow it broke out of that um, situation. Um, and, and a version of this would be a very stable future human society that was averse to exploration, adverse to expansion. And I've, and I've given this quite some thought, and it's actually the basis of a, of a book I'm planning to write. Uh, so we can go into more detail. Basically, I think the biggest obstacle we face is that our descendants will be capable and rich and unified and like that a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, a form of world governments, or at least world mob, world community, where our descendants, say, in the next century or two, get used to having this unified world which has created world peace, which has solved global warming, which has dealt with, you know, ocean acidification and all these other big global problems. And it sort of regulates our behavior to make our best moral intuitions be expressed in how we behave and how we're not allowed to behave. And I think people would really like that. Mm -hmm. They would, because it goes back to our forager roots in terms of what humans were like a million years ago. We all lived in a tiny group and we had decided things communally and we shared things. We didn't fight wars with each other and we didn't compete with each other. And our we just like that as sort of this human home that we came from. And we went on this great adventure uh, out into uh, being farmers and industrialists, but we want to come back in some sense to the forager home of a community where we're all rich, like foragers kind of were in terms of the original affluent society. And we are unified in that we decide things together. We have this sort of world governance and we already actually have quite a lot of more than most people realize the, the world actually is really pretty unified on many kinds of regulations and policy choices. And we like that. And we can even see at the moment, we see someone like Russia defying our, you know, our global consensus. We're outraged and we like the idea that the world's coming together to press that. And um, that's the sort of future we plausibly will have over the next few centuries mm -hmm. as we slowly have more unified world government and more unified thing. And even if we expanded the solar system, that solar system wide government is quite capable of keeping control and managing that and then threatening anybody who deviates from with punishment. And then there will be this choice in a few centuries to allow interstellar colonization. And Everybody will realize if they think about it that that choice allowing interstellar colonization ends the era of unified humanity and unified humanity deciding things together. Once colonies are spreading out fast, it just becomes no longer possible to have all of that part of a single government where everybody votes together and decides together what to do and, and what we all decide is enforced on everyone. And the question, will people want that? Will people allow that yeah, loss yeah. of that unity? I mean, and, and so it would destabilize it. And I mean, I guess you can imagine future technology will provide us with simulations that will allow us to live out an infinite number of lifetimes in a way that has a low impact on the, the true environment. And so you can imagine a, an equilibrium where where there's no reason to extend ever again. And in fact, why would you leave the best place? You know, we well, know that Earth is the best planet in the universe. In the majority's opinion, they don't see a good reason to let you do that. Yeah, that is, yeah. they only see your selfish, crude, destructive right. habits and inclination and what and allowing that doesn't seem like a good idea to them. Because once you allow these colonies to go off, they can grow and then they can come back, <laughs> right? Come back in force, right? And they could impose their will on us again, right? But and so I mean that sounds like a not 
I mean, that's not a catastrophic version. That's a, that's, that's how, I, I mean, you're providing, I guess, that definition of a quiet civilization. Right. Um, so this is my best story for how we could become quiet. Right. And right. so becoming qu quiet in this way is my best guess for the biggest risk to not become loud. The biggest risk is not that something will prevent us from becoming loud, is we will choose not to be loud. We will, all things considered, decide against it and make sure that we impose that decision on all of us. Right. And so a civilization choosing to become quiet could be an explanation for the Fermi paradox. But, but I feel well, all like of them choosing, but that's the key is they all have to 100% of the time. And that's where every single one of these plausible explanations. Well, so it's about the ratio, right? Yeah. So if you think quiet ones appear once per galaxy, then um, we only need, you know, a one in a million failure roughly explains the observations, right? So we could think, okay, there's only a one in a million chance that our, and you know, be choice to become quiet will fail, and that's the explanation for these one in a million deviations of the loud alien yeah. civilizations. Um, so that that's a consistent story. Uh, if we say, you know, there's a million times as many quiet as loud, and they only fail one in a million times to to succeed in keeping their quiet locked down. So I guess the the sort of the more apocalyptic one that I think about is some thing which is impossible to predict, because if you could predict it, then you would attempt to prevent it, you would take different actions. So whatever this thing is, it has to be impossible to predict. It happens 100% of the time. So to every civilization that ever reaches this level of technology, it, it is a 100% uh, dose. And it is it knocks them back to the bacterial age or beyond it essentially wipes out the the entire planet all life on the planet no chance to restore itself that satisfies all of the problem you know all of the small numbers becoming big again and that and doesn't to, go to ahead. make that believable i mean the point is we already see cosmic astronomical processes out there. So if the process we were postulating was some external event, then it would have to come from these processes we can already see and we can and already see the rate of them and so, they just don't fit the bill. Yeah, so you can yeah, you can rule out external events. It has to be an event driven by the, the civilization itself. There has to be an internal dynamic yes. to the civilization that produces this. And now the problem with that is if the civilization itself is broken into many parts, then an internal dynamic that afflicted one of them wouldn't necessarily take them all down. And that's why my main focus is on the scenario where there it is not many parts, <laughs> they become unified is getting into smaller and smaller hands. And, you know, a long time ago, it took an entire nation state to create a nuclear weapon. Now you can imagine, uh, you know, someone with an axe to grind could create a custom pathogen in their own garage and and or a hardworking group of researchers could create a killer artificial intelligence in their spare time using some borrowed compute resource from Google, that it feels like those kinds of existential threats that humanity has never faced before are now plausible on many fronts, where they come into smaller and smaller. So, so again, let's people. walk through those the the threat of an AI that kills off the humans still leaves the AI to expand and yes. become this visible civilization. So that's, ruled out. That's not a problem, so all right? AI researchers should feel okay. perfectly confident. You're, everything is going to be fine. There's no chance you're going to destroy the civilization that you live within. Well, they won't prevent it from becoming grabby. They might prevent its value. That is, they might think that AI replacement is a bad world and they would rather it not happen, but right. they aren't going to prevent the it becoming visible and grabby. Now, if you think about a pathogen, a pathogen could kill all humans even, but yeah. all mammals, yeah. even all primates. I mean, uh, it's really hard to imagine a pathogen sort of destroying all multicellular life. So, uh, you know, we're, we're talking more like a nuclear war or, or a disease killing, a you know, a lot, maybe a, a million years or 10 million years to, to recover. But that's still a pretty short cosmological time. So those are actually pretty hard stories. So again, I think you have to come to a thing that doesn't destroy everything, but moves it into a stable state. Right. That, that has power and capability to preserve that stable state. 
Right. Uh, so, so think about, you know, nations where there's some government monopoly on being the phone company or the car company or something. <laughs> and now there aren't new car companies because the government says you're not allowed to be a new car company. And the old car company is very stable and not with, interested in innovating. And then you can get a stable world where uh, it's hard to to move and grow because the stable world likes being stable and is preserving its stability. The, the, the one, you know, and I've discounted all of those ideas as well. Um, the one that I get to is some kind of science experiment that you mean like a vacuum decay. Yeah. Earth? Vacuum decay, something that turns the earth into ice nine or whatever. And it expands right. outward at the speed of light. Right. But so that's a problem from the sense that, you know, if that happens, that's equivalent to a gravity civilization that spreads out at the speed of light. We would see them. <laughs> yeah. You know, well, we, we would, they would either see them or they would just, you know, end us end everything. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So that, you know, that can't explain in quiet in essence, right. That can explain a, a sort of an extreme loud. <laughs> that's an extreme loud scenario. The, so that's the one. And I guess in fitting in your stable civilization, the other one that I've kind of thought about is that essentially as you know as artificial intelligence continues to ramp up the dangers of runaway artificial general intelligence becomes riskier and riskier and it makes sense to essentially place all of humanity under one artificial general intelligence that can then defend against all the others the smartest one then become right. you know we put it in charge and it will so, right so so that scenario there's a lot of variations depending on what the threat is there to protect you from but the key scenario is something becomes in charge that's authorized yes. to protect us from various threats and it does that protection via some sort of stability it is limiting some kinds of growth and innovation uh under the excuse of it's protecting you from something and it's less matters what it is exactly. And it, it doesn't necessarily even need a threat. So I think like, if you just look at where humans came from in terms of forager origins, we just really like this idea of a unified humanity where we all decide things together. And we will just invoke that for lots of pretty small things like mm -hmm. COVID or, you know, medical experiments or how to run, you know, Twitter, there's just a lot of small problems in the world that we get irate about if those people are allowed to do things differently and people want a center that's going to make everyone do it right. And that's enough for people to support a center and empower it to, uh, and then there's natural processes by which a center over long enough time period would prevent change. And that's, that's, I think, one of the things people don't most realize. So I don't know if you have a software background, a lot of people mm -hmm. yeah. in, say astronomy have a software background, right? Yeah. So most people don't really know about software rot. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Software rot is a real thing. Oh, yes. And it's the fact that pretty much all the large complicated systems we ever build slowly rot and have to be eventually replaced wholesale with brand new systems. And that's a thing that can happen to larger social systems too. And I don't think we think about it or discuss that enough. But so if think of the, say, American legal system. The law has been slowly been getting more complicated and more epicycles and everything, and it's plausibly rotting in the same way that a large software system would rot, except it's not being replaced wholesale. It's just slowly getting more expensive and complicated and cumbersome to deal with. And a central government in the, of Earth, with sort of which sort of encourages sort of central systems all around the world, can in that same way slowly rot. Mm -hmm. So think of medic, medical ethics. It was a striking fact in COVID that even though there's, a, you know, 150 nations in the world or whatever, that nobody deviated from the medical ethics convention that there shall not be challenge trials. And so nobody just at the beginning of the COVID epidemic says, let's just infect a bunch of people, see what happens. And let's get some stats. Right. Because medical ethics around the world all had the same rules and the same norms, and they made sure everybody did it the same way. Yeah. So medical ethics is this complicated system that's slowly accumulating. It's the same everywhere and plausibly rotting. And this, I think, is a path by which the central governance would slowly retard growth and then growth would stop. And then we would know, you know, and right. even regress, not because that was the general policy, but it's just because each of these systems was something we got used to and liked, and we weren't willing to replace it wholesale. So I guess back to my, this idea of this artificial intelligence, uh, I don't know, caregiver you can imagine it reaching some local minima where it has just gone 
you know, I've, I've solved it. You know, this is the, this is the perfect way to run the human society so that they're the most happy, the, the least impact on the environment, the least internal strife, the least amount of pain. And, and, and then we'll just run this ad infinitum until the heat death of the universe. I think the more plausible version of that is that there's some elite committees, United Nation committees or whatever. And for each of various problems, they have a big commission where they study it and they using computer assistance and simulations and everything else, choose some sort of governance mechanism, which may have a lot of computer implementation behind it, which then becomes the standard. And then when people say, are you sure we should be doing this right? Maybe we should change it. They said, look, we put a lot of thought into us. Those people want to change it for this nefarious reason. We can't allow that. And is it, it's better just to keep this slowly rotting, slowly accumulating system as it is. So it might have a lot of computer stuff behind it. In fact, people might not realize just how sophisticated the computers are behind it, but it, that hardly matters in the sense that the fundamental thing is there's a large scale structure and that's not really allowed to be questioned. But I, you know, I, I guess, you know, I don't want to necessarily turn this into a debate, but you're the expert. Um, is that that also feels like it's not a hundred percent. It's the equivalent of you bombing your planet back to the, to the stone age. You're going to have different groups, committees. They're going to come with agreements. There's going to be rot. There's going to be things that break down. People are going to come up with solutions to overturn it. Like it feels like it has to go computer wise to a local minima and then just to a local minimum and then just stop there at trillions of operations per second, like beyond what I mean, the human. The question is just how important are computers to the story? Sure. Like yes. The yes. key story is there's a structure. Yes, and the yes, structure absolutely. gets set in and it's struck yeah. to protect itself. And the structure has a lot of complexity and the complexity accumulates. Right. And there would, of course, be computers as part of that structure. But I don't think it matters that much where exactly computers are in that structure. What matters is it's this complicated structure that entrenches itself. And we see many of those things today. That is, in a lot of regulatory areas, there is not much divergence in the world about how we regulate them. And they are slowly getting more complicated mm -hmm. and cumbersome. And that's true in a lot of areas today, say nuclear energy. It's an amazing fact about our world that, you know, 70 years ago, we had functioning nuclear power and we did not let it take over the world and give us vastly more energy at vastly lower costs. We regulated that to death and not just in one place, everywhere regulated it to death, basically. And maybe now we're letting some places get out from under that. But you can imagine in a world that was more afraid of nuclear power, we would not allow that. Take an example of um, organ sales. Now, that's an old technology. It's very simple, but most of the world thinks that's just a terrible idea. And the only country in the world that has some form of it is Iran. And in Iran, the government sets the price and sets up the system, but at least you're allowed to sell organs. And the rest of the world is just irate. They have medical ethics conferences where they talk all about how do we make Iran go along with the rest of us and stop doing this immoral thing, right? <laughs> That's, that's a technology that basically has been suppressed uh, because of a strong worldwide consensus that it's a bad thing. And that the risks of organ sales are pretty minor compared to the risks of, I don't know, nuclear power or AG, AGI or other sorts of things. So you can see how the government, the, the world is quite potentially able to sort of get afraid of something and make sure everybody goes the same way on how to regulate it, even if they're slowly making it more expensive and harder to deal with. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, you know, it's been, like I said, it's, it's been about a year since you published the, the paper on grabby aliens. Where do you, I guess, what part now, now that you've solved, you know, where the aliens are, they're a hundred million light years away. They're expanding it at a significant percentage of the speed of light. We've got a few hundred million years until we meet them. Um, how should we be prepared? to meet these alien civilizations? How could we build a foundation when you think about, you know, the foundation series and thinking about the long future? What could we do to to have this have this go well? So humanity has always liked to have cosmologies. That is, we, we all lived in a particular time and place and had our local concerns, but we've always wanted to see that in the context of a bigger picture. Through most of history, the grand cosmologies people had, they had big active beings in them. <laughs> they were living cosmologies full of gods and, and demons and other powers that were making big choices. And then we were 
allied with some of them against others, perhaps in, in that big cosmology. Recently, the sort of cosmologies that we all kind of accept are cosmologies of a dead universe, where the only living thing in the universe is people here on the planet Earth, and that's it. And in that cosmology, there's not much to say about what's going to happen in the future. It's kind of unknown. And, you know, the things that matter are just us here and what we do with each other. And the cosmology is dead. So I'd say this lets us return to a living cosmology that we can kind of believe <laughs> and to frame ourselves with respect to it. We can see, okay, we are here and we have, we will either become quiet aliens or become loud ones. And if we become loud ones, we will eventually join these other ones. And then these big things will happen later. And I think that gives us a way to frame our local choices in terms of this big living cosmology. This is the universe, the real universe with living agents with agendas and conflicts, which is much more emotionally engaging than most people as a cosmology. Uh, and it's real. That is not, I mean, recently when we want an engaging cosmology, we go to fiction. Mm -hmm. because the real cosmology looks kind of boring, right? But here's a real cosmology that's living and full of actors in conflict. And we can put ourselves in that and see where we are and see what are the main choices that affect how our story plays out in this cosmology. So the key choice that we face is, will we get loud? Mm -hmm. and, and Once we come loud, it's hard to take back, but you know it's going to be our big choice. And so that's my story is to say, let's, let's if we can agree that this is the actual story, then the, then the thing that it frames is this choice we face it doesn't tell us what the right choice is, yeah. but it says this is the big, maybe the biggest choice we'll ever make. And it's coming up sometime in the next thousand years, maybe. Yeah. And, and as, let's think about it. And as you say, the moment we find out that we're not alone is the moment their galactic oh. empire has, has encircled us. And almost here. They're almost here. Yeah, we've got it. We've got a, a few decades to go before they've before they've arrived. Absolutely fascinating. Well, Dr. Hansen, it was an absolute pleasure to talk with you today and to hear directly from you about about your ideas and thinking about this. Um, it's going to be a cause of sort of incredible, I don't know, speculation and discussion. And I find it really fascinating until they show up and someone can at least explain it to us, that would be great. Um, but again, absolute pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so much. If people want to follow your work, what is the best way to do that? Well, I'm uh, hanson.gmu.edu in terms of web pages. I'm on Twitter at, at Robin Hanson. If you want to learn about grabby aliens, then grabbyaliens.com. Uh, yeah, there's some great the, videos there on the on that. Indeed. Yeah, it was wonderful. I really like that. All right. Well, thank you so much. And uh, and good luck with your research. Take care. Bye. All right. Bye. -bye. Um, where's the button? There it is.